Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's program with coral biologist, Phil Clevis. He's one of our institution's most recent staff member hires. Phil joined Carnegie's Department of Embryology last September from a postdoctoral position he completed at Stanford University. And prior to that, he, uh, he earned his PhD in cellular and molecular biology from Berkeley, UC Berkeley, where he was a National Science Foundation fellow. And before that, he earned his bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Arkansas, Fayetteville. And at that time, he also received the National Barry M. Goldwater Award. Phil's work uh, is part of Carnegie's growing focus and interest on using cutting edge biological research technologies to probe environmental problems, particularly as they relate to the symbiotic relationships uh, between species in, in various ecosystems. Phil specializes in uh, the mutually beneficial relationship between coral and the algae that they host, the life-giving uh, life uh, symbiotic relationship they have. And as he'll explain, uh, due to ocean warming, as well as other changes that are being seen due to climate change, is putting this symbiotic partnership at risk and has resulted, as many of you have seen in recent news stories, in the death of corals in something called bleaching, that we call bleaching. Uh, Phil is the first coral biologist to apply the powerful gene editing tool called CRISPR-Cas9 to probe these symbiotic relationships at the molecular level. He first demonstrated this, um, the potential of deploying CRISPR in 2018 for conservation efforts, and last year, um, in last year, used this Nobel Prize winning technology to elucidate the actual gene responsible for regulating the coral's relationship uh, with the algae and, uh, and the reaction of that relationship to heat stress. Today, Phil is going to describe how he uses this technique, genetic engineering technique, to understand how coral organism works and explain uh, what we're doing here at Carnegie to advance our understanding of this important symbiotic relationship in, in aquatic systems in the oceans. I'm sure you're as eager as I am to hear what he has to say. And so please join me in welcoming Phil Clevis. Phil? Thank you, Eric. Okay. So thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to tell everyone about the work that we are start, just starting to do at the Carnegie Institute for Science in the Department of Embryology. And um, what our lab, my lab is really focused on is trying to understand the molecular genetic basis of a really fascinating ecological symbiosis between corals and algae that really make up the uh, backbone of uh, important marine ecosystem and also understand the genes involved and why this symbiosis is breaking down upon stress that's leading to the mass mortality of corals worldwide. Uh, we're taking a kind of a molecular approach to understand this by using a model system, the small anemone aptasia, and new emerging gene editing tools to really get to a deeper molecular understanding that would help us conserve these fragile ecosystems. So if anybody spent time on reefs, you've probably been blown away by the incredible biodiversity that exists on these, on the, um, in these ecosystems. And corals are animals that quite literally build that ecosystem. They secrete a calcium carbonate skeleton that makes this three-dimensional structure that fish and other organisms can inhabit. And coral reefs are often referred to as the, as, 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 uh, as, as the rainforest of the ocean because of this incredible amount of biodiversity that they harbor. And the success of corals to make these ecosystems in these crystal clear nutrient poor tropical waters is largely due to the fact that corals have evolved a special relationship with algae that live inside their tissues. So in order to tell you about that, I have to go through a little bit of anatomy. So corals are colonial animals that are made up of a bunch of polyps. Each polyp has a tentacle, a mouth, a gastric cavity. Um, the polyps have two cell layers, an outer layer that's called the epiderm and an inner layer called the gastroderm. Inside that gastroderm, there are algae that live inside the tissues. And these algae perform a critical nutritional symbiosis for corals. Essentially, they feed the corals. And I'll tell you how that works. So if you zoom into a particular gastrodermal cell, here I'm drawing as a square, um, the algae are living inside of the animal tissue. 
in a host-derived vesicle called a symbiosome. These algae photosynthesize, so they make energy and sugars from the sun. And those algae translocate those sugars that they derive from photosynthesis to corals. And this is a really important point. So this, the, 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 the photosynthetic products that the algae give corals provide corals with enough energy to live in these nutrient poor tropical waters. And in return, the algae get inorganic nutrients and a place to live from the coral host. So I'm going to take this a little bit away from the abstraction and take it, take, show you what this looks like inside the coral tissue. So what I'm showing you here is a zoom in of a coral polyp. This particular species is an important reef building coral called Postlepora damacornis. You can see that the coral polyp has you can see that the coral polyp has tentacles that are kind of forming a ring. Inside that ring is the mouth. But I wanna draw your attention to all the brown spots. So all those brown spots are algal cells that live inside the coral tissue. And this performs the critical nutritional support that allow corals to live in these, in these crystal clear tropical waters. And I wanna take a minute and just to emphasize how profound this is. This is analogous to us having plants that are growing in our skin and we walk outside every time we're hungry to get fed. And, and this bizarre and a little bit alien relationship between an animal and algae really is the, is the backbone of the coral reef energetic requirements that allow corals to thrive and make these three-dimensional structures. We know that this symbiosis is important and actually critical for corals, in large part due to the fact that the symbiosis breaks down upon thermal stress in a process called bleaching. So when water temperatures get one or two degrees higher than what a coral particularly sees in a region, they'll undergo something called coral bleaching, where the algae that are inside the coral tissue are actually expelled from the coral. And we call it bleaching because once those algae are pushed out of the coral tissue, all that you, you see a coral, the translucent coral tissue, and then the white skeleton underneath. So the animals look bleached. And if remote water temperatures stay high and the animals aren't able to repopulate their tissue with these critical nutritional symbionts, the corals will starve to death and die. And this is leading to mass mortality of corals worldwide as ocean temperatures are increasing due to climate change. And in fact, over the past several decades, we've seen the increase of global bleaching events increasing that's been putting a lot of pressure on our ecosystem, uh, coral reef ecosystems and leading to lots of mortality. A particularly striking example of this happened in 2016. It was a global bleaching event, but it particularly hit the Great Barrier Reef, which was on the eastern, northeastern coast of Australia. Over the course of only a few weeks, about 30% of the Great Barrier Reef died due to coral bleaching. And just to give you a little perspective of what that's like, the Great Barrier Reef is about the size of Italy. So imagine 30% of our ecosystem of that scale dying due to global, global, global warming and coral bleaching. Despite the havoc that's really happening to the world's reefs due to global warming and the breakdown of this important symbiosis, we know very little about the genes and the molecular pathways involved in coral bleaching. And just like understanding the genes that underlie human diseases, such, like, such as diabetes or cancer, we believe that a deeper understanding of the genes involved in coral bleaching will allow us to to design therapeutics or amelioration strategies to help conserve this important reef ecosystem. But the state of play right now is that we don't know very much about the molecular genetic basis for why corals bleach or if there are genes that control their susceptibility or their, their resistance to bleaching. And that's largely due to the fact that corals are often difficult to study in the lab. For example, they come in inconvenient sizes I often like to joke here, like the idea of taking this coral back into the lab and putting it in a microscope, it seems pretty daunting. 
Um, I also, uh, they also are particularly hard and slow to grow in the lab, although we're trying to do this at Carnegie. They have hard calcareous skeletons. And for the second half of my talk, I'll be telling you about the genetic engineering work that we're doing on corals. And we do that at the larval stages. And so due to the reproductive seasonality of corals, we only have seasonal access to larvae. So that inhibits the types of experiments that we can do year round. And so a major strategy for biologists in general, particularly one studying human diseases, is to take a laboratory model system approach. And so a lot of what we know about what genes do in humans and what the genetic basis of human disease is, we're, we're found out by using model systems, for example, mice, fruit flies, plants, Arabidopsis. And so we're taking a very similar approach to study coral bleaching and symbiosis with a model system. And we turn to a small anemone aptasia for, that we think is actually an excellent model for studying the symbiosis and bleaching. Aptasia is a, an anemone that's often considered a pest in the aquarium trade because they're so hard to get rid of and they grow so fast. Um, but that's perfect for us because we want an animals that are easy to grow in the lab and grow really rapidly. And um, they have several aspects of their biology that we think make them excellent candidates for a, la a laboratory model system that I'm listing here. Most importantly to me is the fact that they're symbiotic with the same types of algae that are often found in corals. Actually, we can take the algae out of corals and we can put it with uh, an association with anemones and they'll form a stable symbiosis. So it's show, that shows that the lessons learned about the genetic pathways learned in Aptasia are likely going to be true for the symbiosis in reef building corals in the wild. We can grow them rapidly in large clonal populations in the lab. Interestingly, we can actually culture them with or without their symbionts. And so unlike corals that die when you uh, remove their symbionts, we can remove the symbionts of the Aptasia and they'll, they're able to, to survive as long as we feed them enough in the lab. And so that allows a powerful opportunity to find genetic changes in the anemone that are associated with the presence of the absence of the symbiosis. And we also have year round spawning in the lab. Another really interesting and uh, powerful method that we can use in Aptasia is the fact that we can recapitulate these massive bleaching events that are happening on the reefs worldwide in a petri dish in the lab with our anemone Aptasia. And so we can bleach anemones. We usually keep them at 27 degrees. What you're looking at here is a uh, image of an anemone. And what you're, all that red you're seeing is the chlorophyll autofluorescence of the algae. So the red are basically the symbiotic algae. We can move them from 27 degrees to a temperature that will bleach the anemones at 34 degrees and hold them there for 10 days. And what you see is a periodic loss of algal symbionts as the anemones bleach. So we're using this as a really powerful laboratory model system to find, try to find the genes that are involved in triggering or protecting against bleaching. And we had a recent publication last year with our first round of findings. And we're also, power, we're also applying state-of-the-art um, live imaging technologies to really associate cellular changes of bleaching with uh, gene expression changes. And so there's a technician in the lab who came with me from Stanford, Lorna Mitchison Field, who's been doing some powerful experiments of actually trying to watch the bleaching process in anemones. And so what you're looking at here is an anemone polyp that has been held at a bleaching temperature of 34 degrees. The white here is actually the chlorophyll autofluorescence that we turn from red to white because it makes it more, more easy to, to visualize in this video. So what you're going to see is actually streaming of the algal cells as the anemone bleaches and then ultimate eruption of the, of the algae out of the mouth of the anemone. And so you can see the, the algae streaming down the tentacles and then 
um, and then uh, the algae erupting out of the mouth of the anemone. And so what we're trying to do is use powerful cell biological approaches and genetic approaches to try to correlate what genes are changing that are responsible for the actual breaching process with Aptasia. And we've made some progress with that. So we've been able to identify some genes that we think are involved in both this maintaining the, symbio the symbiosis and bleaching in Aptasia. And this has been a pr pretty powerful method by being able to do pr to precise laboratory controlled experiments in Aptasia. But ultimately, we're going to want ways to functionally test candidate genes. So are any of these genes actually involved in symbiosis? In more established model systems, what you would generally do is take a gene that you think is, say, involved in symbiosis, and you remove that gene's function and see what happens. And that powerful reverse genetic approach will allow us to start to understand what the functions of genes in these systems are. But when I came to the field, we didn't have the ability to do that, either in aptasia or in corals. And we've been able to make some progress in building those tools, both in Aptasia and corals. And I'll tell you about the work that we've been able to do in corals to build genetic manipulation techniques so that we can understand the functions of genes. So unlike some organisms that are readily grow in the lab, like Aptasia and Drosophila, corals um, are mostly most happy in the wild and they spawn once a year in, by, in the middle of the night by the full moon and the corals that we were working with were off the coast of Australia. And so in order to do genetic manipulation on the corals, we needed to wait for them to spawn. So we have access, access to their eggs and sperm and introduced uh, CRISPR-Cas9 components through microinjection. So what you're looking at here is a, is a coral colony that's spawning in the middle of the night, eggs and sperm into the water column. What we do is we take that egg and sperm from the, from the water, we do the fertilization, and then we micro-inject components into the egg to manipulate target genes of interest. And this has been done with a collaboration, a long-term, long-time collaboration of friend Lena Bay at the Australian Institute of Marine Science. And so we go to annual trips to catch coral spawning to do these types of genetic manipulations. And what we actually do is we use this new powerful technique that has really revolutionized the ability to do genetic engineering across many different organisms. It's a tool called CRISPR-Cas9, where genetic engineering was only available for a handful of organisms like mice and flies and yeast. Now with CRISPR-Cas9, we're able to genetically engineer many different types of organisms to study what genes do in these diverse animals. For example, lizards, butterflies, cows, and so we decided it was a nice opportunity to try to use CRISPR-Cas9 to genetically engineer coral with this microinjection technique that I had developed. And so our strategy was to fly to Australia, you know, in the three days that corals were supposed to spawn. And we were going to microinject CRISPR-Cas9 components into the cells to try to knock out a gene of interest. And the way CRISPR works is you have a Cas9 protein. This protein has the ability to cut DNA. And that's associated with a programmable sgRNA or RNA. So we could program this RNA to go to a specific place in the genome and it will bind the Cas9 protein and make small deletions and insertions in the target gene of interest. So um, exactly how we do that is we make the RNA and the protein, we mix them in a tube and we inject this Cas9 protein into those one cell zygotes in the middle of the night, right after corals spawn. That, that protein goes to a specific place in the genome that's guided by the sgRNA. And now if we guide it to a particular place in the genome that has a gene, then we can disrupt that gene function and ask what happens. And we also do Cas9 only protein as control just to make sure the injection doesn't have the effect on the phenotype. And so when we were first designing these experiments, it was kind of a, um, it seemed a little stressful flying halfway across the world to wait for corals to spawn and then inject them to try to do a new technique to do, to, to edit their genomes. Um, but we wanted to, and the, one of the biggest questions for us is what genes do we go for? Like if you wanted to show something works, what, 
um, you want to study a, a trait that's of ecological importance. And so we decided to go for a gene that we thought might be involved in coral tolerance to heat stress, because as I just explained, corals are, um, are an increasing threat due to climate change. And through experiments that I don't really have time to tell you about using our little anemone aptasia, we actually were able to find a gene called HSF1 that we thought would regulate the heat stress response. And this was due both to the experiments that we did in Aptasia, but also what was known about this protein in other organisms. So we thought that HSF1 would be a great candidate gene to show that we were able to make mutations. And we think HSF1 actually has a role in the coral's ability to tolerate heat stress. And so that was exactly the question that we wanted to ask. So what, what does HSF1 do in the ability of, of coral to tolerate heat stress? And so what we did is we targeted the HSF1 gene in two different places using sgRNA um, targeting exon three and exon nine. And luckily we found, and excitingly, we found that nearly every animal was completely mute for HSF1 after microinjection. And this was a huge breakthrough for us and it definitely motivated the fact that we had just flown, flown halfway across the world to do this experiment um, and the fact that nearly every animal was now mute with this CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And so we didn't stop there. We actually did the experiment to ask what happens when you make mutants in HSF1, are the corals able to survive heat stress? And the results of that experiment are, were that the animals that were injected with Cas9 only uh, survived well, but the mutants of HSF1 started exploding in response to heat stress. And so we're really excited about this result for two main reasons. One, it shows that HSF1 is a master regulator for coral's ability to tolerate heat stress. And now we're really interested in studying whether or not HSF1 has a role in protecting or inducing bleaching. And um, then the second reason that we're interested in it is also it shows for the first time that we're able to genetically manipulate corals to study gene function. So now we're rolling out this technology to study genes involved in lots of aspects of coral biology from symbiosis to bleaching. And so we're really excited that this technology really opens a whole field of reverse genetics in corals. And we're, we're actually pushing along to other phenotypes. So that work was done in 2018. In 2019, we went back to Australia with a kind of a fundamental question about how does a coral make a skeleton? And we're interested in this question for two main reasons. First, I think the skeleton of a coral is very charismatic and on first principles, uh, it's just beautiful how does an animal make something that's as regularly patterned as this. And second, we know that ocean acidification is going to impact the ability of corals to make a skeleton. And so we believe that understanding the genetic pathways that are important for a coral to make a skeleton, then we'll be, be able to better predict what's going to happen to corals, particularly in their bioremineralization, include future climate scenarios. And uh, previous research found that a particular transporter, a bicarbonate transporter, is expressed at the site of skeleton formation in corals. So corals have these cells called coleoblasts. Those are cells that actually lay down the calcium carbonate skeleton. And it was hypothesized that this bicarbonate transporter is actually required for skeleton formation. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to see if that was true using our CRISPR-Cas9 technique. And so what we did is we injected larvae with uh, CRISPR-Cas9 components against this bicarbonate transporter. We settled the larvae to make little baby corals. And so what you're looking at here is a coral that has a, um, several tentacles, a mouth, and then this pattern that, that looks like the spokes of a bike wheel. Um, after two days post-settlement, the those spokes of a bike wheel will start, start to be filled by skeleton. And so we wanted to look at three days post-fertilization in animals that had mutants, mutations or were wild type for the bicarbonate transporter and ask what would happen to the skeleton. And here are the results from that experiment. So the uninjected animals and the Cas9 only animals, both of these controls seem to do well where these, uh, they made a nice beautiful skeleton 
that were the that they were arranged like the spokes of a bike. However, the animals that uh, were injected with sgRNA Cas9 um, against the bicarbonate transporter um, failed to make a skeleton. And so we identified using Cas9 that this is actually indeed an important gene for controlling the biomineralization, which is kind of a hallmark phenotype of corals. And so we're excited by this because it shows that we can use CRISPR-Cas9 to develop coral mutants past the larval stage and really probably study phenotypes that are specific to the adults, for example, skeleton formation, bleaching, um, and, and, um, and, and, and symbiosis, aspects of symbiosis. And so in the lab here at Carnegie, we're really going to take an integrative approach to understand symbiosis and bleaching by using cell biology and advanced genetic tools that we've built both in Aptasia and corals to um, gain a deeper molecular understanding for uh, the, the genetic basis of these traits. And our hopes are by understanding the genes that underlie these ecologically important traits, we'll be able to help conservation and, and guide conservation efforts in ways that um, uh, in, in ways that will help us conserve these valuable ecosystems. And so finally, I need to thank everybody involved in this work. First, uh, my lab here at Carnegie, it's just starting. Natalie and Lorna are both technicians in the lab. And Amanda, who's a, a PhD student um, that's joint with Macquarie University in Australia. Um, the Pringle Lab, where I did my postdoc work, particularly John Pringle and Chris Renicki, who have helped with um, the transgenic work in Atasia that I didn't get to talk to you about today due to time. And then several collaborators uh, in the United States and abroad that have really helped push this, um, this, this project forward. And so um, happy to answer questions. Thank you, uh, Phil. That was uh, that was really wonderful. Just perfect. Um, we do have a lot of really great questions from the audience today, and uh, I also have a few that I'd like to ask. But let's start um, first. Uh, you mentioned um, you mentioned at the beginning that coral, especially the Great Barrier Reef, saw this dramatic uh, die off in twenty sixteen of about thirty um, percent. First, of, first of all, are there places in the ocean where coral are seeing or recovery, are they seeing actually expanded growth because of uh, climate conditions? That's a good question. And that's kind of what you might expect on per first principles that you would get a rain shift um, as okay. certain areas become hot, you would, you would get an expansion of range. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that it's, we're seeing some rain shift, but the, these, these heat events that are killing coral reefs are kind of um, the, the high maximums for a particular season, for example. And, and what that does is it makes it so that the corals aren't able just to move down to a lower region because they might not be, the, nor the normal temperatures might not be high enough to keep them right. when the temperatures are, are spiking. Right. Um, in terms of recovery, we're actually seeing a lot of recovery. And I think that that's one of the questions in the field is, um, you can go out and you can see massive amounts of bleaching. You see 30% of the Great Barrier Reef um, died. And then you also see a lot of it come back. And so the question is, how much will come back? What genes and molecular pathways control the resistance to coral of corals to um, bleaching or the propensity to come back? And I think that those are really yeah. interesting open questions. So perhaps a related question, but, but maybe even a little broader is, um, it's interesting that coral and its symbiont, the algae, have, have evolved over, let's call it millions of years, to be so narrowly symbiotic. In other words, temperature changes, as you showed, by a couple degrees, and they give up the ghost, so to speak. Right. Whereas if you go back into the fossil record, of course, you know, life on Earth, the, the temperature of the surface, Earth's surface has changed dramatically over the, over the millennia and even millions of years. Um, is the difference that we're turning a switch here and it's going too fast for evolution to take effect? Because presumably, if you go back millions of years, you do have corals living in a world where the temperatures were warmer by more than a couple of degrees. Yeah. So why is it that they can't adapt now? I think that's a really open question. And that's, yeah. a, that's a question that I really want to know the answer to is, is what, 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 what is the potential for corals to adapt? And I yeah. think that that is kind of the, um, 
one of the one of the big outstanding questions in the field, and we're interested in looking at that from the genetic level. But there are a lot of researchers that are interested in what 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 is the potential, what is going to happen to reefs in the next 100 years. Um, I would say that the answer to that question is not very clear, and yeah. um, and I think that that's probably going to be a, a major focus. One of my dream you know, sci maybe even sci-fi experiments would be to be able to, just by genotyping alone, could you go out and predict which corals would be the most likely to survive? So make like a 23, 20, 23 and me for corals where you can go out and you can say, okay, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, based on genetic predisposition are going to be the corals of the future. And I think that that's kind of um, very ambitious and very sci-fi, but I think that, that that type of tool would be hugely beneficial for conservation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we had one question, a few questions actually, maybe a little more detailed, but important. Um, maybe you could spend a, a, a minute just describing a little bit more what symbiosis actually is. What does it actually mean in, in the context of, of the algae and the coral? Yeah, so the, the, the what, what happens in this symbiosis is that the, the corals have, a, have cells and the algae actually are living inside the cells. And by symbiosis, we mean that there's a beneficial interaction between the algae and the host and, and the, the coral. And so the algae are actually giving food to the host and the hosts are actually giving a place to live in, in, in organic nutrients that may be limiting in an environment to the algae. So in that case, there's you know, a really intimate interaction between those two organisms. And that's what we kind of mean by symbiosis. You know, one could argue that all species on this planet are in a, in a, in a some sort of symbiosis, right? Because we're all interacting and whether or not that's beneficial or parasitic, I think is a whole yeah. Conversation and it's it's this HSF one which is as you found out responsible for that that relationship that gene that single gene that's responsible for that symbiosis is that uh, typical of of you know all of us are symbiosis I mean if you look at all organisms human beings are symbiotic with each other but also with our own microbiome our own so to speak algae the bacteria is there are there is it is it becoming known that there are such discrete genes that are responsible for these relationships? Is this something, I guess maybe ask a broader question, which is what you learn in coral might very well be applicable in many other situations since we now know pretty much everything from plants to humans to animals are symbiotic in some way with other species. So is this, is this a path toward understanding more about those relationships? I think it's I think it's a phenomenal opportunity to understand how our bodies work by studying this symbiosis. So I actually have a, a, a student in the lab whose background is in mammalian immunology, and they I showed this person you know a list of genes that are differentially regulated between animals with or without their symbiosis, and the student was struck by the fact that a lot of these genes are hallmark genes for human immune systems. So genes like NF kappa B and all these kind of, uh, all these um, you know, traditional genes that people study for human immune systems seem to be playing a role in regulating the symbiosis in aptasia. And so I think by understanding the aptasia immune system and the coral immune system, it's going to give insights to, to what we know about the early evolution of our own immune systems and probably even the modern day functions of it. Yeah. And I think that the, the, we're just at the tip of the iceberg. So this is a case where a microbes inside of an animal. So the algae is inside of the animal and actually doing something good. Traditionally, people think about microbial interactions with animals as parasitic, you know, COVID-19 is a, is a great example of this, but we're just starting to learn about beneficial micro, microbial interactions. And I think that this is a wonderful opportunity to understand how these types of interactions happen in animals. So I think it's going to have broad implications even outside of coral conservation. Yeah. Um, here's another interesting question, which is, you know, you're talking kind of, you're, you're starting to think about engineering corals. So you've talked about identifying the gene. And now of course that opens up the possibility of adaptation or even genetic engineering of coral or the algae, one or the other. Um, but the question is, you know, given that you, you're stuck only in this narrow window when they spawn, is it possible to think of genetic engineering coral in the lab so that it will spawn a dozen times a year or basically give you more data, uh, more ability to do the kinds of studies that you're doing? 
Yeah, there is there's a some real heroic efforts to get coral spawning regularly in laboratory environments. And uh, Jamie Craig's is somebody that, that's in the out of the UK has really pioneered this work. And we're actually working with him right now to see if we can get a coral spawning facility here at the Carnegie Institute in embryology um, department where we can get spawning year round so we can do these types of experiments more than once a year. Um, in terms of engineering those, I think it might actually be simpler than that because it turns out that corals spawn naturally based on largely on light cues, we think. And so you might be able to just flash different lights at different times under on different corals and then get the spawning when you want. And so that's yeah. uh, that's 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 primarily work that's been done by Jamie. It's, but it's really exciting new frontier, especially merging it with the um, with the gene editing technologies that I've been able to build. Yeah. So getting back to this, this interesting relationship, this, this symbiosis, uh, one question is how, how do corals actually find the algae? How do they find the algae? And then wh where do they come from? <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's a, that's a beautiful question. And it's baffled people for a while. Cause if you look for the algae in the water column near reefs, you don't really find them. And it's, and it's true that some coral species or maybe even most coral species that spawn uh, eggs and sperm, they, those, egg, those larvae that are derived from that fertilization need to acquire symbionts from the environment to form symbiosis. And so what are the molecular pathways that allow that to happen? Um, and that's something we have no idea about. There are some corals that inherit the symbionts from their, um, from their mother, so they yeah. come along with the egg. Um, but we do know that the algal type really has an effect on the, sub the susceptibility to bleaching. And so one, uh, um, you kind of talked about this a little bit before, is that why would corals bleach if they need the algae? And so one model that's been around for several decades now is that maybe bleaching is adaptive because it allows corals to switch out their symbionts to symbionts that are more likely to be um, thermally tolerant, for example. And so that's, uh, that's a model out there. And indeed, we see some of that happening after bleaching. So, presumably that's trial by er trial and error. I mean, coral are stationary. It's not like they can get up <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and search for the, you know, oh, that one looks good or this one looks good. So is it, is it largely that the, uh, the, the, um, the oceans are, are, replete with or lots of different types of potential symbionts and they basically learn through some kind of natural selection or some kind of selection process which That's wants it. to uh, and, absorb and the selection process may be bleaching itself you know and, yeah. And, yeah. And, and at least the, the current pressures now but with experiments in Aptasia, what we've been able to show is that there is some specificity so the organisms that we have prefer some strains of algae over others. And so there's probably some hardwired genetic limitations there, but we just I don't see. know. And, but yeah. there, to, to get to your first point, yes, the, there's a lot of diversity in these algae and these algae kind of all have different physiological consequences yeah. to the coral. So, so, but when, when a coral bleaches, it's because as you pointed out, you know, for some reason they, they give up their their algae, right? That change in temperature, maybe salinity, whatever it causes them to give up their algae. Can that algae then be taken up by a different species nearby? And the, the Great Barrier Reef is beautiful colors largely because there are many different kinds of, of living coral, right? And can, do algae, do they share? So you, I think you mentioned that they might share algae. Do they, can they actually exchange algae? I mean, is there, there there's, yeah. is there a, and, and does each coral have a very different uh, range of acceptance for different types of algae? Is that something we know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. answer to all those questions are is yeah. kind of yes. So there's, yeah. you know, there's hundreds of different species of corals. Some of them are, seem to be specific. Some of them seem to be um, more generalist. Um, there, if corals that are bleaching algae, we've done these experiments in Aptasia. If you bleach the Aptasia, you could take the algae that come out and reinfect another another anemone. And so, yeah, they're not dead. And so that's a really important interesting. Uh, yeah. opportunity for switching of symbionts between. That's them. interesting. So one way to think about it maybe is that the coral multiple corals say on the great barrel leaf are, are living in a, in a microbiome of, of algae basically that, that have a range of, of genetic uh, adaptability or symbiosis with, you know, that, that allows them to be symbionts. And so that's right. interesting. That's interesting. So it becomes a, it becomes a really interesting thought about maybe switching genotypes of algae could be a real adaptive 
measure. And some uh, researchers, particularly one at the University of Melbourne, is, is trying to use that as an opportunity to make corals more resilient. Yeah. And, and yeah. by just switching to more resilient algae. And maybe yeah. that's a process that's happening naturally. Yeah. So at some point you were talking about how it was, you know, maybe difficult that you had to travel all that distance for that one week when the corals spawn. But I think a lot of people watching your pictures are probably thinking, man, he gets to go hang out on the beach in Australia, North, yeah. Northeastern Australia. Maybe you could say a little bit more about what it's actually like to be a coral biologist who works in the field. I mean, you know, you're, you're out there for a week, you've got a limited time to collect specimens. You've got, you know, what's it like? I mean, you're, you're not on a beach resort. You're presumably doing you know, you're out there as a field scientist. So maybe you can explain a little bit more to people what it's like to be out there doing the kind of stuff you do. So one of the, so, so one of the real luxuries of my science career has been working at the Australian Institute for Marine Science with my collaborators, Lena Bay um, and, and others. The, it, it's, a, it's a state-of-the-art molecular facility and coral re rearing facility. And so um, if I would have to be honest, it feels a lot like working in the lab here at Carnegie, where it's just, um, you know, feels like a lab. And this, the difference is, is that we have access to corals regularly spawning because the reef is right there. Um, and so what does it feel like from a, a day to day basis, I would say. So I said this a little bit in my talk, but the corals spawn over three or maybe four days in November. And so we spend about two or three weeks before, you know, making sure everything's perfectly packed. And then we throw all of our gear into a suitcase and we fly to Australia. And mo this work has been done with, uh, started with just me um, uh, and, and, and another team from the University of Texas. And then now, it, now I usually bring a team of people to Australia. And um, kind of we wait around until the coral spawn. And so the corals will generally spawn around 10 p.m. And it's really just one of the most beautiful aspects of nature that I've been a part of is that all the species of all one of one type of coral, all, all one type of coral all spawn at the exact same time, right at dusk. And so it's, and this is evolutionary. Um, this is an evolutionary reason for that because they want to fertilize with their own species in a huge ocean. Yeah. Uh, and so we're kind of sitting there waiting for the corals to spawn and then they just do it. And then that's probably around nine to 10 PM. And then you spend the next six hours staying up all night, micro injecting coral with CRISPR components, yeah. uh, just, just a, a conveyor belt of eggs, you know, to try to get enough material to do these genetic manipulations. And then around three or four a.m., you go to sleep, and then you do it again the next day, <laughs> and, and over and over again. I think that the 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 beachside um, uh, moments of you know sitting on a beach, like you know drinking mai tais or whatever, that comes after all the experiments are done. When we usually <laughs> go on a commemorative um, uh, snorkel trip where we can yeah. go actually see some corals yeah. outside in the lab. Yeah. yeah. I want to come back to just before I ask that question, this question, a lot of people are wondering, you know, when, when corals bleach, they're dying, right? But they can recover. There are cases where they can recover, which is actually, who is, which is actually re rejecting which, which symbiont? Is it the algae that says I'm out of here? You know, I, I'm done. It's too hot in here. Or is it, is it the coral? Is that, or is that not known? I love, I love this question. I think it's a question that always comes up, you can bring this phenomenon into uh, any group of people and everybody will always ask that. And the, another thing I really like about this system is that there's so many unanswered questions and we really don't know. The predominant model for why corals bleach is that the algae are producing something that the corals don't like and then the corals expel it. But we have evidence that that might not be the case. And so I think that by understanding the molecular genetic basis for why corals bleach, we'll get a better answer to who's making the decision. Because I think who's making the decision is a really important answer or question to answer because that will tell us uh, where we should focus our conservations on. Maybe it's more important to get the right type of algae out there rather than the right type of corals. Yeah, yeah. Um... You know, uh, another question that, that seems to be coming up is that you've been talking about almost entirely about uh, thermal changes, changes in the ocean temperature, which you know are occurring actually across the whole globe. But are there other factors like even air pollution, since they're so dependent on sunlight, uh, photosynthesis through the algal symbiont, um, are there 
other factors like acidification, um, uh, other things that are also causing the coral to, to die? Yeah, I think that that's, that's kind of the tragic scenario here is that it, they are kind of multi, they're impacted by multi, multiple stressors. So acidification, pollution, agricultural runoff, heat, um, it's, you know, it's just a, a full onslaught for these, um, for these ecosystems. There's, there, there are reefs where a lot of those other stresses can be managed. Like you can manage runoff, you can manage uh, pollution of, of, of various sources, but it's gonna be really hard to manage global temperature changes, yeah. especially since that's like chronically affected these ecosystems. I think it's really important to know what the adaptive potential of corals are. And so yeah. what these ecosystems will look like in hundred years. Yeah, yeah. A um, little bit more, uh, dig a little deeper into the science of CRISPR-Cas9, the question about what it, Cas9, which is a protein as you've talked about, uh, what is it? What is it? I mean, maybe you can describe a little bit about how it's so precise as a surgical tool for going in and literally cutting individual base pairs, individual genes. Yeah, so the, the CRISPR, the CRISPR-Cas9 is a gene editing tool has really, like I said, really revolutionized our ability to genetically manipulate organisms. And the reason for that is that you have a Cas9 protein that has the ability to cut DNA. And when that cut DNA is repaired and makes small insertions and deletions, you can actually use that cut DNA to insert pieces that you want. And that's a technology that we're hoping to apply to corals. Um, but the real power is not the protein. The real power is the RNA because you can program that RNA to go to any place in the genome. So as long as you have a genomic sequence and you have the ability to introduce these two components into an animal, it's kind of a uh, uh, one size fits all for making uh, a genome mutations or genome edits. And so that's the real power of it, is that it's, it's a system that's exogenous to, to animals. You can introduce it. It's simple to relatively simple to introduce. And it appears to be a, able to act across a lot of different cell types in, a, in many, many different species. And so um, that's kind of the revolution of, yeah. of, of Cas9. Yeah. yeah, it's really an amazing uh, tool. And as, as, as you had mentioned, I mean, this tool was invented more on the, you know, sort of uh, biotech and biomedical side, looking at more animal type species and not so much the ecosystems that you're looking at. But if you, um, if you had uh, perfect future vision and you could peer over the walls to what's next, would there be, are there innovations you could imagine would be incredibly important for you to have? Uh, you're fielding, as, as we said, you're the first coral biologist to actually apply that tool to coral. What other tools could you really, really, what would you dream of using if you could to, to help solve a problem like uh, as big as this coral problem? I mean, it's, it's such a beautiful question. I, I think they'll, you know, it, the goalposts have been moving pretty quickly. Yeah. You know, we've yeah. been able to build genetic engineering cool tools really quickly. You know, I think if you would ask me that question five years ago, I'd be like, it would be great to mutate a single gene in corals and see what it does. Right. And so the goalpost is moving. I think that one of the huge, huge, um, um, powerful systems is unbiased screening for gene function. And so that's, that's, that was been done in, in flies. It's been done in yeast. And that allows us to not be clouded by our own vision right. about how things are supposed to work. We can just screen for lots of, of genes uh, in the genome, see what, what any of them do. And so what I would like to have is a screening platform for corals so that we can unbiasedly find genes that are mm. responsible for the symbiosis. And actually, we're trying to build tools to do those types of things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't it be great to build a, a, a cell culture platform so that you can do CRISPR screens in corals or, um, or you know, even, even to do crosses in, in, in Aptasia. And so I think that, that that's kind of the, the frontier. With CRISPR, we've really been able to reveal reverse genetics, but I think uh, you know, I think forward genetics where you're screening unbiased would be a hugely powerful for this. System. Yeah. All right. So we're, we're almost out of time. I'm going to ask one last question and take the uh, interviewer's prerogative and ask a question I'm interested in. Just a big question about the future of coral on, on the face of the earth. And 
you've painted a you know fairly optimistic view that using science and using the tools you're using, you might be able to figure out how we might, you know, reversing engineering, reverse engineering the symbiosis, we might be able to engineer a solution. What's your sense? I mean, I've even heard some people say, forget the coral, let's go to the rainforest and figure out how to save those at this point, right? Because those are also under threat due to climate change. But do you feel in your in your heart that that coral is going to be we'll be able to save this incredibly important, not only important for food stock, but for for people, um, but we'll be able to save coral by by science in the end. One of, one of my favorite uh, movies of all time was a, was the movie Jurassic Park, where Jeff Goldblum says life will find a way. And I think that that's like a pretty that's like if there's a unifying principle of biology, it is that. <laughs> and um, and so will corals look like the corals that we have now in 100 years? Will it look very different? Will it be mostly mollusks? I think that we don't know. But I think it, one of the coolest parts of being a scientist and a biologist is that we have the opportunity to ask that and, 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 and ask that question and try to answer that question to be able to predict the future and make the future ecosystem something that we would like to give to the next generation of humans. And so I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an open question. It's fascinating. I would say about the need for conservation, I would say that the, um, the degradation and the loss of coral reefs um, in these international panels for climate control, climate change, these were predicted decades ago. And so it's a little bit of a canary in a coal mine here that the corals are appear to be a very, uh, very uh, sensitive species to the types of pressures that we're putting on this earth by changing the, in, by changing the environment. And so I would say that, um, that it's, we should focus on trying to do what we can to reverse the effects of climate change, um, because the other things that are also predicted, if we keep on the same trajectory, is not a, tr is, is not a world that I would be particularly yeah. excited to see. Well, that, that's a great, a great, I mean, it's a positive note to finish on, um, and great uh, <laughs> that, I mean, I think it's really remarkable how you're using basic science, the tools of biology, to try to fix a really important global problem. So. Thanks for a really great, uh, great talk, Phil. Um, Thank you. And um, uh, really appreciate uh, the, the clarity and the and the and the expertise you're applying. I, I I can't help but saying that you've been here for what only six months at Carnegie, and you so much instantiate the Carnegie scientists taking tools and applying them to entirely new problems. So so really great talk. And thanks for that. Thank you. Thank, and I want to thank all the attendees here for joining us this afternoon. Um, it was, uh, I really appreciate the enthusiasm with which you all uh, uh, participate in Carnegie's research efforts and these public programs. So thanks for coming. And one last thing is I hope you'll join us on March 30th. Um, we're going to be hearing from a Carnegie alumna um, uh, who is now at MIT. She's an astrophysicist at MIT, Sarah Seeger, who, uh, who actually she was in our department of terrestrial magnetism. You may know that department. She was a staff member there. And she will talk about exoplanets and the search for habitable worlds. So hopefully we'll see you then on March 30th. And thank you again for joining us and good evening.